I'm back. Good morning, Acts 433 Church, and good morning, Facebook Live friends as well. You are in for a wonderful message this morning, and if you believe it, can I get an amen? Amen. All right, praise God. To close out our Grace and Suffering series, um, I want to do so in a very unusual way because I am an unusual kind of guy. That's another good place to insert an amen if you know me well. Amen. <laughs> I want to look at grace and suffering through the lens of an often overlooked scripture. In fact, it's the final greeting of Peter's first letter. So why don't we turn to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5. We'll be in the very back of your Bibles, 1 Peter 5, and uh, verses 12 through 14. Now, the final greeting that Peter has is kind of the way that I envision it in my mind. It's kind of the P.S. part of the letter. You never want to skip over the P.S. because there's always something important included in the P.S. part of a letter. Um, I love that. In fact, I, I'm kind of bummed sometimes when I receive letters. Well, I don't receive letters too often, maybe emails uh, more so. When, when there's not a P.S., because there's something fun usually in that. And as we read Peter's concluding remarks, they are powerful. And it reads like a script from a Viking special on Netflix. So without further ado, let's see what I'm talking about. In verse 12 it says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Just with that first verse, there are many questions that, that should be uh, popping into your mind, floating around in your head right now. Uh, the first of all, you might ask the question, well, who is Silas? Who is Silas? That Peter, by name, would single him out in his concluding remarks. No one else but Silas. And, and, and Peter mentions Silas because Silas is the main support that he received to carry forth the very things that God was calling Peter to do. There's an old song, I think it came from St. Peter's Day, uh, I get by with a little help from my friends. And that's, what I, that's the song I hear when Peter's writing this mentioning Silas. He's thinking, Man, I am so grateful that God would bless me with this, this gentleman who was there and gave me the encouragement and the support I needed because ministry is difficult and the task at hand seemed overwhelming. But he was there. And so I want to ask you, if, if Peter is Batman, Silas would be... I, I knew I'd get you. I knew I'd get you. I was going to go with his butler because let's be honest... Who's more of a superhero, Batman's butler or Robin? I think it might be his butler. So <laughs> I was thinking uh, Silas is, is like his butler because there was things that Batman's not thinking about because he's just so entrenched in, in saving the people. And, and the same is true with, with Peter as he's going forth with the gospel that would save uh, many. Uh, in fact, the first day he preached, over 3,000 were saved. But, but the point is, um, there's, because of his help and his support, Peter actually takes a moment to stop and to write this letter. And, and, and so I, I think of it in terms of, uh, you've got Peter kind of going out like Batman, but he would not be ready and he would not be, would not be as effective if he didn't have someone like Silas at his side making sure he knows about him. He actually is one of the guys that helped the Apostle Paul as well. And so you have Peter and Paul um, and it says that uh, if you look at Acts 15, you don't have to turn there, but a good reference uh, verse, Acts 15, 22, uh, Silas is actually selected by the church elders to return with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch following the Jerusalem council that they had. And Silas is mentioned in the Bible as being a leader among the, the brethren where he would encourage speakers. That's an important job. I mean... I know how difficult they can be, and, and praise God, when I've gone to different retreats and different camps, the ones that are set up really well will have people designated to be praying for 
the speaker of the week and will be there actually ministering unto them because they're pouring everything that they've got to the people that are there. And so that's Silas. He's, he's one of those guys. Silas is selected by Paul to accompany him on his second mission after there's a split. If you, Paul and Barnabas uh, have an argument over Mark's uh, part, participation. And here's where you'll probably remember Silas, because you, you probably heard that name. It probably is in the back of your mind. Where did I hear that name from? During that second mission, uh, Paul and Silas are imprisoned in Philippi, where an earthquake breaks their chains and opens the prison door. And so if you ever study uh, uh, art out, and you see a guy in the paintings, and it's a biblical scene, and you see a guy and his chains are broken, a lot of times that guy is Silas. I told you he's a superhero. Breaking chains, or having the chains broken, that's what God did, but he's a super guy. I just want you to know that. I want you to know a little bit about Silas, and I want to just spend another minute on him. According to Acts 17 and 18, he would travel with Timothy and Paul from Philippi to Thessalonica. They were treated with hostility in the synagogues by some of the traditional Jews. The harassers follow the three of them as they make their way to Berea. They threaten Paul's safety and cause Paul to separate from Silas and Timothy. Paul then travels to Athens, and the story goes that Silas and Timothy will later join up with them in Corinth. And I share all of that to tell you that there is a wealth of knowledge in the Bible about Silas. He's incredibly important uh, to the spread of the, the church, the early church in the first century. So then when we go back to verse 12, Paul writes, With the help of Silas, whom I, whom I regard as a faithful brother. Now doesn't that sound almost like uh, too modest of a statement? He's a faithful brother. He's, he's almost more than that. But uh, he says, I've written to you briefly. I want to pause there. I've written to you briefly. With the help of Silas, dot, 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 I have written to you briefly. It is possible that without Silas's help, we might not have 1 Peter at all. And if we didn't have 1 Peter... Because Silas is there helping him, we wouldn't have such gems as, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We wouldn't have, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We wouldn't have cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We wouldn't have, and each one of us received a special gift, employ it serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And the hits keep on coming in this letter, this letter of 1 Peter. And this is because of the encouragement of Silas. So if you're following along in your notes first note that I want to point out is that phrase, with the help of Silas, what's going on there? Is Silas is using the spiritual gift he has, he has this gift to encourage. And he encouraged Peter to use his own gifting to stop what he's doing. It was great, but take a moment out and, and write a word to the Christians who have been scattered, that are exiles, who are throughout the region. And his, his encouragement to Peter to use his own gifts results in the spreading of the grace of God. I firmly believe, I firmly believe this, that a big part of the reason that so many uh, Christian churches were established and that Peter was able to reach so many people with the gospel is because there's a guy behind the scenes who's there with him, who's encouraging him, who's his aid as he goes forth into the ministry. And what we have in verse 12 is a perfect example of God through Peter uh, exalting Silas through the written word, as mentioned in verse 5 and 6. If you look in the same chapter, 
go up a few verses. It says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. What can I say that this is Silas's due time? Uh, and I can guarantee you that, si that when Silas was doing what God called him to do behind the scenes, and so many people don't even have an idea of what he is, what he is uh, uh, doing, I, I, I bet you that he never had any idea that some 2,000 years later in Oakland County, uh, we would be talking about the very works that he was a part of. And I'll go one step further. I bet you Silas never knew that his behind-the-scenes work would be broadcasted on Facebook Live where it can reach people anywhere, and it'll be archived, and it can spread the gospel some 2,000 years later. I bet you he had no idea. Think about all the behind-the-scenes stuff that you're a part of for God's glory. You think, nobody even notices when I do. What does this amount to? But God does. And maybe you haven't seen the results yet. But I can promise you that God's word says that not only is he giving you his grace to, to do forth the things he's calling you to do, but at the right time, God has a plan that you might be exalted. And man, Silas, you didn't even know what it was going to look like when the mighty hand of God would exalt you in due time. Maybe you got word about Peter including you in the letter, and you thought that was pretty cool. But did you even fathom how far-reaching the impact would be? I told you the final greeting was, was a good one. And I'm not even done with verse 12. It says, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother... Now, to make this message grand, i got to tell you the secret of encouragement. Because I don't want you to think that Silas, I know he has the gift of encouragement, but I don't want you to think that you don't have the opportunities to be a Silas in someone else's life. We all do. It's so blessed an opportunity that we have when we can encourage someone in the faith. And so the question is, and this is probably the second question that maybe you were thinking of, is how do you encourage brothers and sisters in the faith? Pastors, nonetheless. Imagine you're at one of these, one of these uh, retreats, and, and the staff comes up to you and says, you know, your job this week, what I feel that God wants you to partake in, is I want you to encourage the speaker this week. <laughs> Where do I even begin? I mean, come on, that, that's a pretty, pretty tall task to ask. But the key is in this word faithful. You'll see that word faithful in the text. The word faithful is this word pistos in the New Testament, in the Greek. And what it means is one who trusts God's promises. And so what Silas did, and the reason he was such a good encourager, If Silas would remind Peter, Paul, and I put him possibly Mary. That's a, another that musical. Like a another musical reference there. Of the promises of God. Because I can tell you when you're deep in the trenches, you can start to lose sight of the promises of God. And when he would remind him of the promises of God to put your trust in God's word, this is what served as a word of encouragement for those who are on the front lines. You know, and so if you're at that retreat and there's a guest speaker and he needs a word of encouragement, um, how about God's word never returns void? What you're here doing is touching lives, it's impacting people. And so praise God for this opportunity you have. Even if you're up there and you feel like no one's listening, the Holy Spirit is working. And I just wanted to encourage you with that. 
as you go forth and continue to share forth the message that God has placed on your heart. There's a whole lot of things you could say. But you go to God's word, the promises he's made. Put your trust in that. And that is what, in fact, will encourage the other person to continue going forth in faith to see God do the miraculous. I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Why does Peter write this letter to begin with? Why did he stop everything he was doing? He was involved with so much great stuff. But why did he stop what he's doing and take a moment out to write this letter? He reminds us in the summary, the reason he wrote this is to encourage us. That's really interesting. In first verse 1, chapter 1, he says, I'm writing to you exiles, those persecuted Christians forced out of your homeland, foreigners in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I'm reminded to take a moment out and to encourage you all. Why? Because I myself have just been encouraged by Silas. That God has sent to encourage me. So praise God for Silas. What a far-reaching impact he had. As he encourages Peter, it's a reminder that, hey, there's other brothers and sisters in Christ that I need to stop and encourage right now. That are probably feeling a little bit like I was before I was encouraged myself. It's so beautiful. You see, this is the grace of God that found Silas who in turn ministered to Peter, who in turn ministered to scattered Christians. And this letter in turn uh, ministers and encourages us. And so what do we do with this? We go and we encourage others in the faith. It's the grace that never ends. It's it goes on and on, my friends. See, she just borrowed that. That's not an original lamb chop. <laughs> Song that is that is right here in First Peter. It's the grace that never ends, and so I'm writing to encourage you. Number one, I'm writing to encourage you. That's important. You need encouragement because what you faced has been difficult, and the road ahead, I can promise you, in this world is going to be have tough moments. But two, number two, I'm also writing to testify that I'm speaking. The true grace of God. So when we deconstruct that statement of why is Peter writing this letter, we get something here. Encouragement in the faith can only be found in the good news of Jesus Christ. I guarantee you that. Because if there's any law preached, love you or in order to be accepted by God, that's not going to encourage you, because you're going to look at your track record and go, oh boy, I missed one. You know, let me go down that list, 613 of them. Whoa, not good. Encouragement in the faith is only found in the good news of Jesus Christ, that he paid the price, that he did it all, and we can rest in his finished work because we stand before God Almighty, and we stand righteous, we have a right standing in the eyes of God because the blood of Christ has removed all of our sins and made us perfect. So anything else is a false gospel because it's not the true grace of God. And that's why you're going to be encouraged. It's the only way. And so John was clear in 1 John 1.17 that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Peter wants to remind us, stand fast in it. And in that is, is a very important word. In the Greek, it means to be of a steadfast mind. One who doesn't hesitate, does not waver. Don't waver from it. Don't think that there's something else that you have to add to this equation to, to, to be right with God. Don't let anyone deceive you, Peter, saying, and move away from it. And so, finally, moving to the next verse, because I preached a long time on verse 12. I'm going to quickly go through verse 13, but I want to stop at verse 14 just for a minute because there's something very powerful there that we want to just kind of, in our American culture, maybe makes us a little uncomfortable and we want to just wiggle past it. You'll see what I mean in a minute. 
But in verse 13 it says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Just a couple little footnotes here. It's not super important, but this is John Mark that he's talking about here. From Acts 12.12, 12, Acts 15.37. Now, Peter was actually Mark's mentor. It's not his actual father. He refers to him as, as his son in the same way that uh, Paul would refer to Timothy as his son. It's not biological, just to clarify that. He's his mentor. He's, his, he, he's, he's taken him under his wing. And Babylon, that's written here, is not actually Babylon. I just want to point that out. It's actually an allegory uh, uh, to Rome. He's talking about Rome here. And the reason for that, that he would write in such a way and call it Babylon, is, is there's many facets to it. Number one, uh, just as ancient Babylon was a center of enmity and oppression of God's people, so Rome had become such at this time. Remember in, in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he's saying you've been spread out, you've been forced to leave your homeland because of Rome. So he's, he's, he's equating the two. Now it's Rome that's oppressing you. It was Babylon before. Uh, another reason, as Babylon was destroyed, he's also putting the two together because he's, he's saying Rome will be destroyed one day as well. Uh, number three, he wants to remind his readers that they are the Israel of God and they are exiles in a foreign land. Uh, as were the ancient Jews when they were in Babylon. That's why he says Babylon here. And number four, the point of this allegory, the main reason he would use this, uh, is that Rome was becoming the oppressor of the new Israel. It's not literally the center of the world, so I just wanted to point that out. So for our um, ge geography buffs, um, don't think in terms of the actual geographical lands of Babylon uh, he's just equating the two in the similarities. But here's where we kind of get a little wigged out in our American culture, and you'll see what I mean in verse 14. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, I'm not suggesting that we adopt the culture of the early church here, uh, and we kiss everybody that comes through the church doors. Uh, in fact, that may be a great way uh, if you're on a committee at your church where you're trying to um, really be welcoming to new members, uh, new guests, uh, to get people to never come back through your doors again. Give everybody a, a nice kiss as they make their way into your church. Um, I kind of laugh when I read this verse because God knows one of the reasons, and there's many, uh, that he sent Pastor Steve into my life is to help me become a better hugger. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, Pastor Steve, naturally, it comes to him. I'm not so much of a touchy-feely guy, so uh, this verse was, was very interesting to dissect because I said, God, I know that you want me to preach verse 14, even though I like to avoid it because it talks about kissing and it makes me uncomfortable. But there is something going on here that's very significant. Uh, the kiss in this culture is a sign of fraternal affection. Christians at this time were accustomed to welcoming or dismissing their companions in the faith with a kiss. And so you say, yeah, what does all that mean, Pastor Matt? Uh, it means this. No, I don't have this. This is a bonus. So upon greeting a fellow believer and upon them leaving, greeting and leaving, it was always a greeting and departing of love. That's very key. Very key. Agape is the word that's used there. It means goodwill, love, benevolence, and brotherly love. Why might it be so important for Peter to once again say, Hey, when you see your brothers and sisters in Christ, kiss them when you see them, kiss them when they leave. Why is that important? Imagine something happened, um, or you heard something, about John Doe since you last saw them. Well, a lot of times, especially with rumors, sometimes it's not very flattering what maybe you might have heard about John Doe. But if the last time you saw them, you greeted them in love, 
And the expectation is no matter what happened in that distance between they left you and you see them again, the expectation is to greet them in love. It doesn't allow room for separation and also a, a splitting or a, a, a negative effect on your friendship with them. You see, in this very same chapter, in verse 8, uh, Peter writes about the enemy, our enemy, the devil, prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. In John 10.10, 10, he says, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So think of that in terms of relationships. If you've got a solid relationship where you're encouraging one another in the faith, don't you think that the devil would like to do nothing more than to split that strong friendship apart or at least put some doubt and some, you know, some, 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 just make it not strong? The reason for it is the devil knows the power and the potential of a Peter and a Silas, of, of a Paul and a Silas. Greet each other in love and depart in love. Uh, and I know the depart isn't in there, but that was custom. So when he's saying greet them, it's when you see them, and they would just naturally do it when they depart. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And here's my, my last word. Because of what I just mentioned, I believe Peter's use of peace here, irene, is best defined as peace between individuals, harmony, concord to all who are in Christ. And so the key is this. The bond of being in Christ is nothing else. If you think it's because you both share an affinity for the NBA or you both love Neil Diamond, or whatever. Trust me, it's not strong enough when things come. But the bond of being in Christ is what can bring harmony between individuals and make it possible to greet one another, uh, to greet each other and depart from one another always in love. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. If this message has blessed you, you can support the ministry work of Acts 433 by going online to acts433.com. Click on the donate button on our homepage. It has been a blessed uh, time together. And we're concluding right at 1130. So I'd like us to bow our heads in prayer, thanking God uh, for his Holy Spirit and giving us this message this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I get excited types of relationships that can form because we are brothers and sisters. We are family members in Christ. It doesn't matter what our backgrounds are. It doesn't matter how different we were. Uh, Lord, I thank you for Silas and all that he did, did uh, to help the brothers and sisters who are exiles spread throughout the regions. I thank you for ministering to us and I pray that in turn we use it to encourage others in the faith. You know, it's so hard with so much different messages that are out there, but I know for a fact that encouragement can only come when we spread the message of the gospel, the true grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter says, stand fast in that. Don't let anybody get you to waver from that. Stand in it. So, Lord, I pray for everyone who's joining us now and those who will join us later as they get this message after the fact. Lord, I pray that you'll safeguard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not that their salvation's in doubt, but that they don't believe anything that could be harmful to them. Lord, I pray that we begin to practice the very thing that may be lost in the church a little bit. That we, that we greet each other in love. Not so much the, the kissing part that's important. It's it's the love. It's the, man, I'm so happy to see you. I can't wait to see you again. And whatever I hear in between, I'm not even going to pay any mind to that because I know who you are. You're a saint and you're a child of God. You're my family member. And Lord, may we even be bold enough to take a stand if we hear some garbage about our brothers and sisters. Because I don't stand for that in my own family. I don't.